Hi, this is Seth Whitehead, and today we're in Oblong, Illinois, to visit with longtime Illinois Basin oil man John Larrabee. And uh, we're going to talk to John about his long career in the oil business and also the Illinois Oil Field Museum, which is located in Oblong, uh, where John's been the curator for many, many years. John, thanks for joining us today. Yeah. Uh, um, can you talk about how you got involved in the oil business, how you got to the point to where you are today, where you're still very involved in the, uh, the Illinois Basin. Yeah. Well, I was born and raised south of Oblong, Illinois. Uh, there's oil field just to the east of us, no power there. They used to, every night, we had an old two-story house. We didn't have air conditioning, we slept upstairs, and this old power would go putt, 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 all night long, all day long. And if it'd go down at night, it'd wake you up because it's so quiet, and it'd also put you to sleep. Anyway, we used to go back there and watch, we, we were always told to stay away from it because you could get hurt. But then I went to high school and I was planning on going to the Marines and uh, I did everything but sign the papers. And the guy who lived south of me, he was a driller on a rotary rig. And he said, John, he said, we had a fellow show up sick. Would you come and help us out for a while? I said, yeah, I'd love to. And of course, I went there and I roughnecked for three years the guy never came back to work. I worked for that for three years, and I drilled for four years. We drilled wells from north of Springfield to Madisonville, Kentucky, and Santa Claus, Indiana, and I loved it. I got my blood, and then I got on for Marathon Pipeline out of Stoy, Illinois. I worked there for three years, transferred to Lima, Ohio with the pipeline. I was up there a year, got transferred to, down to St. Elmo, and uh, I was down there for about 10 years, got transferred back to Robinson office as a crude oil buyer. And I traveled to Illinois, Kentucky, and Indiana. And they told me in 1983, 82, I was going to be going to Houston the first year. And I said, I'm not going. They said, well, you don't have a choice. You're in middle management. They can do what they want, which they can. So January 2nd, I turned my resignation. They said, why are you quitting? I said, I'm not moving to Houston. I went down there six or seven times a year. You had to live 50 miles from town, and, and the traffic is something else. And I went and business for myself, been very lucky. And I didn't leave Marathon totally empty-handed. I remembered a lot of stuff. And I lucked out. And then in 1989, I thought, John, you made a mistake because we all got down to $10 and a half. And I had a lease up here north of Oblong that I'd been trying to get, and I finally got the thing leased. And it was going to, my lease was going to be expiring. And I had an old cable tool rig, an old Bessars 24. And I said, my son-in-law was working for me. I said, Tony, do you think we can drill a well with that thing? They used to drill wells, that's what they used to turn. Well, we can try it. So anyway, it took us 21 days to drill 850 foot. And the well came in at about 30 barrel a day, which is thank goodness. And that kept me afloat. And then the price all started getting back up. Uh, I've been very, like I said, been very lucky. And I've been to OGA and I've met a lot of good people. And a lot of people have helped me. And uh, that's where I'm at then. I was president of the OGA in 1999 to 2001. And uh, I uh, met a lot of, like I said, a lot of people, and if I can always ask someone for advice, and they'll give me good advice. And here I am today talking to you, Seth. Let's uh, talk about being involved in every facet of the oil business. Uh, what, what is it that you like the most about the oil business? Uh, the excitement of drilling wells and putting them on production to see how they do. And of course, I drilled a well up here north in 1993. I uh, took it down to 9,200 feet, the deepest well been drilled in a four-county area. And we didn't get any, well, we drilled it down the, to the granite. And just right above the granite is Mount Simon. It's sand down there, which I didn't realize. The sand was that deep. We didn't have anything, but we came back up to 3,000 foot, and there was a level there that produced it. But it, uh, it, was, it was an exciting well to drill. Your story in the oil industry is is definitely interesting. I think we could go on and talk get get into really into the details, but um, it tends to be a little bit overshadowed about something that has nothing to do with the oil industry. Could you talk a bit about uh, your connection to Jack Ruby? Could you talk a little bit about that? And really, just uh, you think of historic events and uh, what happened back back then is is about as historic as it gets. But could you give people the backstory on that? Well, my folks had a florist. And growing up, and we had 
people salesmen come by, and there was a fellow by the name of uh, High Rubenstein came down and sold ribbon supplies and different supplies for a florist. And he came down, he was from up in Chicago, and he would come down in the summertime, we had a big garden, and he'd come out there and pull weeds and hoe in the garden and you name it, and he did it. And he loved to do it, and I loved to see him come down there that way, I didn't have to do it. But he'd come down when the stuff was ripe, and we'd gain tomatoes and cucumber stuff he'd take back home. And anyway, my dad had a stroke, and he was up at Danville in the VA hospital, and uh, we called him High, High Rubenstein. We, we didn't know he had a brother. We knew he had a brother and a sister. My dad was a hard shell Democrat. He was a hard shell Democrat. And they'd sit there and call me and just give the Republican hell. And uh, anyway, my dad went down to the LVA hospital. And High stopped in there one day. And I'd, I'd go up there every weekend, see my dad. He said, uh, you hear about my brother? And of course, we'd saw him shoot Jack Ruby, shoot Oswald. We didn't know, they just said Jack Ruby, that didn't tell me nothing. But anyway, he came up there and saw my dad, and uh, he said, that Jack Ruby was my brother, Jack Rubenstein, and uh, we didn't know it. Anyway, he kept telling us about it, and he said, now, he called my dad, dad, and my mother, mother. He said, now, mother, he said, I know this is, is hard on you, your dad being, your husband being in here. If you need any financial help, let me know. And he said, I got plenty of money and I will help you. And mother said, we don't need any help. And, uh, but he stopped in at least once a month up at Danville VA hospital. And he would still come down to the house and, and visit with us. And he looked a lot like Jack did. And uh, he was younger than Jack. But anyway, he sold all these floral supplies. Of course, they found him guilty and he, they, he and his brother and his sister had a lot of money. They had lawyers, and they came down. He said they broke us. The lawyers broke us because we hadn't had to try to defend our brother, even though we saw it and he knew who we shot him. But we still tried to get him, and it said it broke our family. Anyway, then Jack died, and we I had his address, Hyman address, and I sent him a sympathy card to Jack or to. Jack Ruby's brother high, and about three days later, I got a card back from him, a sympathy card, that, and I still got that card. And then uh, when they had that 50th anniversary of Jack Ruby's killing, the papers came down, the TV crews came out, and they interviewed me. And there was a girl that was a nurse in that Parkland Hospital there in Dallas. She was raised and born, born and raised about a quarter of a mile from where we did in Oblong, just south of Oblong. She was a nurse in that operating room when they brought Kennedy in, and uh, she had the dress that he had been wearing and, when it, and it had blood stains, Kennedy's blood stains on it. And also the undertaker that did the work was from St. Elmo, Illinois, and uh, you knew him, Seth, I'm sure. Anyway, uh, she did come up here and we did uh, interviews with the TV crews and had a lot of pictures. I still talk to Phyllis. She's, probably 84 years old. She lives down, still lives down in Dallas. She comes up here about once a year. Uh, good friend. Actually, I had no idea there was a connection to St. Elmo, and uh, I've, known, I've known you for a few yeah. months now, and I had no idea that your connection, um, and really for two people from Oblong to be connected in, yeah. in indirect ways, that's just yeah. that's some kind of story. Talk about a small world, and I bet you can. I bet you'll never forget the day that you found out that your friend's brother. Yeah, I did. We had no idea. Was Jack Ruby, so that's crazy. Well, they said that Jack Rubenstein. Well, that didn't tell me anything. Right. But until they cut it down to Jack Ruby, that's where <laughs> we found out. John, can you talk about how you got involved in the Illinois Oil Field Museum, which is here in Oblong? Well, in 1961, they started this museum. Uh, some people who's older than the oil business thought that there's only seven of these museums nationwide. And we had all this equipment and all what made Crawford County. And they had a lot of equipment, so people started gathering up this equipment back in 1961 and took it down to the Oblong Park and just let it sit outside. And they built a building and put a lot of the smaller stuff in. And uh, it really went hog wild for about four or five years, and the city had a curator hired down there as a retired mar uh, marathon employee, and uh, then it just, just kind of like it died, and people lost interest in it. 
Anyway, in 1989, the thing started going again. We finally got we got the money from the state of Illinois to build a building. We bought six acres here where it's at now, and we built this building for money from the state of Illinois. And uh, we got started increasing the thing and getting sent money in from the Illinois Oil and Gas Association, IPRB, and a lot of people started donating money. We built this building here for $140,000. We're not in debt. We will not go in debt, because that's where you have your problem. But we do a lot of work, a lot of volunteer work. We have two people hired in the summertime, Wednesday through Sunday, one to five, and uh, they're very knowledgeable in the oil business. We have a building to the north, a, a supply store, uh, that they used to buy, buy old equipment and tools and so forth. We got another building that Marathon Refinery had a scale model of the refinery in 1987, and it cost $80,000, $85,000 to build in California. And Bechtel Corporation moved the thing back here, and they, I was working for Marathon in the office over at Robinson. The plant manager said they had to get rid of this scale model because they needed the room. I said, have you thought about giving it to the oil museum? No, they hadn't. But I said, we'd be interested in having it. So they, he called Finley and about a week or so later, he called me at the coffee shop. He said, John, he said, they'll, they'll let you have it, but they have to have a key to the building where they see it. And I said, that's no problem. So I came back to the city of Oblong and, and the board meeting, I said, if you build a building, we got this $85,000 scale model. And it is quite impressive. And uh, well, they said they'd build a building. I went back to the marathon and told them that we'd build a building, give you the key. So we moved it over here. We got a, old trucks, and old diamond tea trucks, and a lot of equipment outside, and we're very proud of what we got. Now, you mentioned that you have volunteer staff. You yourself are a volunteer. Yeah. And you've you put a lot of time and effort into this. Why do you do that, and why do you feel this uh, museum so important? Well, this sort of museum, oil of museum in Crawford County, is not built in Crawford County. It also built Illinois. We have a lot of tax money goes into to Illinois and Crawford County, and Everybody, a lot of people get, still get all checks from oil production here in Crawford County. And it, the state of Illinois gets a lot of oil. A lot of people in Chicago has no idea there's any oil in Illinois. We had a state rep, state senator, a U.S. senator, uh, went to Washington, D.C. and had met with him. And we had our tags on there, Illinois and Gas Association. And he didn't know that oil was in Illinois. And I said, uh, have you ever been to Southern Illinois? Yeah. I said, you haven't been to Southern Illinois. I said, where you been? He had been Springfield. I said, there's a lot of Illinois south of Springfield and more in Chicago. And he came, I invited him down here and I called him uh, probably about every two weeks, his office in Washington, D.C. And he finally came down. It was the first time we ever had a U.S. Senator here. And he was quite impressed. And he stuck his hand down the oil. And of course, that oil gets on your finger, fingernails. But he uh, was quite impressed. We bought him a hard hat to wear. I went back up there the next year and he had that hard hat up there on the, behind his desk and had his name on it with the uh, Illinois Oil and Gas Association. But he was quite impressed with it. He said, I wish more people knew about Southern Illinois. Well, I do too. But it's, uh, we're proud of what we got here and we just like to display it and what we can do. That's obviously one of the reasons we're here today is to, to help inform people of Southern Illinois' yeah. history and the and the big history of the oil industry here. And it's just, it's very rich right here in Crawford County. Can you yeah. talk just a little bit about the history of Crawford County? Well, in 19, there's been drills with wells around here in 1905. Uh, the other wells make, make one, one or two barrels a day, which wasn't that much. And they made some gas up here in northern Crawford County and they pump, pumped it to Annapolis, a little town up there. But the gas kind of petered out. And they were just going around drilling wells, trying to find some deeper oil. The old story is, and which is not a, out of the question, there were three guys in Pennsylvania, West Virginia, riding around the buckboard, and they supposedly had this bottle of whiskey they were going to drink out, and when they got to run with the bottle of whiskey, they threw it over the shoulder, and that's what they were going to drill. Supposedly, that's what they did. I, the story is not really not 1906, not that far away. There's some people that I knew that were born before then. And, uh, but anyway, they, Supposedly they threw this over their shoulder, and uh, they drilled, that's where they drilled the well. 
It came in at 100, 1,500 barrel a day. From that well, ever if you started moving in the little town of Stoy, with about 50 population, it got to 4,000 within a year. People had tent city. They got pictures of, of Stoy tent city, and there's see there were two hotels and all kinds of bars and post offices and barber shops and everything else. And of course today the post the Stoy is about 40 population. It went downhill fast. But it's what we created to work and they built a pipeline or built a refinery at Robinson within five miles. It's built Crawford County and from here they went on south to Lawrence County, Wabash, you know, from all down in southern Illinois, over to St. Elmo and Irvingham and Fayette County. They found a big field down there and down in Marion County. It's uh, it's really created a lot of jobs, a lot of work. And just so folks know, um, though the production levels here in Crawford County aren't what they once were, uh, this county is still a top 10 producing county. The industry is still a major employer here. Of course, the refinery in Robinson, uh, still a number of and hundreds of, of upstream jobs as well. And uh, one thing that I really can't emphasize enough, uh, the industry generates tax revenue that funds local schools here. So, you know, the history of this industry continues on um, more than 100 years after the, the big Shire well came in. And it's interesting, you know, the, the techniques have changed a little bit. You went from whiskey bottle to whiskey bottles to 3D seismic and but whatever works. So, um, but that's a fascinating story of that uh, the discovery well here in Crawford County. And uh, John's going to take us out and show us uh, uh, some exhibits of that and a number of other things. But um, we want to emphasize that, you know, the second part of our interview here, we will take a look at the museum, but uh, we want folks to come up here and check it out for themselves. In case you're not familiar with Oblong, it's on Route 33 between Effingham. I should say Newton. Don't yeah. want to overlook Newton. Lovely town. Uh, Newton and, and Robinson. Um, so um, it's, a, it's a little bit off the, the, the typical interstates that, you know, we, we take most places nowadays, but it's definitely worth the trip out. And uh, if folks are interested watching this and are like, I want to go check that out, um, what do they need to do to, uh, to, to get a, a, a tour arranged? Well, like I say, we're open last May through September or October, 1 to 5, Wednesday through Sunday. It's here in Oblong, which is Oblong. It's like, it's like it's not a square, it's an oblong. But when they started the city of Oblong years ago, it was not called Oblong, it was called Hen Peck because the guy had built a store here in Oblong by the name of Henry Peck. And uh, people didn't like to say they was from Hen Peck. So they changed the name to Oblong because that's the way the layout of the city is, an oblong shaped. But that's then they changed the name to Oblong rather than Hen Peck. Did you also tell you that uh, back in about 1990-something, I started another company at OPEC, Incorporated. My daughter and I... Oh, yeah. Did Let's you want that? check it out. We've got a Bye. OPEC member hat here. Yeah. The other OPEC. Can you tell the, the viewers about uh, this OPEC, not the version that most folks are familiar with? Yeah, this OPEC is back in about 1990. I was sitting around the table one Sunday afternoon, my daughter's daughter. Uh, I said, we need something about OPEC. So we came up with the OPEC, Oblong Petroleum and Exploration Company. And we came up with a big nice diploma saying about being a member of the OPEC organization. I am recorded in the state of Illinois. I have a corporation about OPEC Inc. We had these hats with certificates. A lot of operators bought them and we gave a lot of them away. She does this calligraphy and she'd write the, they'd send it in and I'd put there and have her put the name in her calligraphy, it looked really neat. And they'd frame it and put it on the wall. And we still got, they can still go to a lot of these meetings for people's business and they still got that certificate up on the wall. Not that it's good for anything, but it's just kind of impressive that OPEC from a little town of Oblong, the only place they could be would be Oblong, Oblong Petroleum and Exploration County. We had a lot of fun with it. And you guys are not a cartel. And we're not a cartel. No peg had no income. All right, John. Well, it's been a pleasure talking to you today. And everyone watching this, be sure to check out uh, next week's uh, second part of this interview as John will take us through the Illinois Oil Field Museum located right here in Oblong, Illinois. Be sure to check it out. Thank you, John. Thank you. Thank you.